So let's take our Bibles, please, and go to Matthew chapter 13. If you're new to Cornerstone, that's what we do here. We teach straight through the Bible from cover to cover, and we find ourselves in the Gospel of Matthew right now on Sunday mornings. We're going to be looking together at chapter 13. So if you'll turn there with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. And let me pray, and then we'll dive right into our study today. Father, it's good to be in your house. It is good to gather together, either here in person or those who are watching online together. We just want to lift up our hearts to you. We just pray, Lord, that you would use this time in your word to speak to us, to strengthen us, to draw us closer to you, Lord. And for those who don't know you in a personal way, may today be a day when they surrender their lives to your lordship. We love you, Lord, and we thank you that you first loved us and send your Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Bless this time in your word. Now we pray in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13, there are seven parables that Jesus teaches, the last six of which are about the kingdom of heaven specifically about the kingdom of heaven, because each of those six parables that round out the chapter 13 of Matthew, each of those six parables begins with the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then Jesus makes a comparison. Now, my eighth grade grammar teacher, Mrs. Whitcover, if she were still alive today, would be happy to know that after all these years, I have remembered that when making a comparison using the words like or as, it is a simile, not a metaphor. And Jesus makes six simile statements, the first of which are all identical. The kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. But then within these six parables are six different comparisons to help us understand exactly what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he uses a teaching tool that is common to the ministry of Jesus known as a parable. Now, if you've been around church very long, you understand what a parable is. If you haven't been around church very long, let's first define what a parable is. And let's also define what the phrase means, kingdom of heaven, before we take a look at these six different parables. So first thing first, when we talk about a parable, it is from the Greek word parabolo. The Greek is the original language of the New Testament, and parabolo means to throw alongside of something. So it's the idea of something that comes alongside of something else, and in this case, it's the idea of a comparison. So a parable is the use of an illustration, often taken from everyday life, thrown alongside a lesson to express a moral truth. And so Jesus uses parables to supplement a point he is trying to make. The word parabolo in the original language appears 48 times in the Gospels, but only in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John makes no mention of any parables in his Gospel. So that's the idea of a parable. It's just, it's an illustration thrown alongside a lesson to drive home a moral truth, to express a a greater point. Often parables are kind of veiled terminology to get the, the listener to think what is actually the meaning behind this. So it's a great teaching tool that Jesus often used in communicating and teaching. What does he mean by the kingdom of heaven? Well, Matthew of the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew is the only one who uses the phrase kingdom of heaven. And Matthew uses it more than 30 times in his gospel. The other guys, Mark, Luke, and John, instead of using the phrase kingdom of heaven, they use the phrase kingdom of God. And so when you look at the difference between kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God, there's not much. Uh, Both of them express the idea of rulership. It's the idea of a kingdom, whether it's kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. The idea here is that it's about a kingdom, a kingdom that is ruled by God. And when it comes to the idea of the kingdom of heaven, this kingdom is both physical in that heaven is a real place, and it is also spiritual in that the kingdom of heaven speaks about God ruling not just in a place, heaven, but also ruling in a person, meaning us. 
In other words, in a broad sense, the kingdom of heaven is about God's rule in the hearts and lives of people. And thus, people who have surrendered their hearts and lives to Jesus as king make up, we make up the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus enthusiastically calls, welcomes, and invites people to be a part of that kingdom, to submit our lives to him as king and to enjoy all the many benefits as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And it has been said, and it is true, the retirement plan is literally out of this world. (laughs) And so that's the idea of the kingdom of heaven. You know, look, we have to admit, somebody is ruling your life. Somebody is ruling your life. Either you are king of your life, which means that you decide what to do, when to do, and how to do it. You are in charge of your life. You are the captain of your ship. Or God is king of your life, which means that when God is king of your life, you surrender to his lead. And you don't just live to please yourself, you live to please God. But there cannot be two kings in this kingdom. It is impossible for you to be both king and God to be king. Uh, It is one or the other. This is not a co-regency. It's not like God slides over and allows you to run your life some of the time and he'll run your life a part of the time. Uh, This is either you belong to him and he is king of your life or you are king of your life and you rule your own life. And so Jesus is going to use six parables here to basically say... Here's what it looks like to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven, where God is king of your life. So we're going to look through these six pretty quickly. And the first one for you note takers, the comparison that he makes here, the simile that he uses, is the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. If you have your Bibles open there to chapter 13, look at verse 24. I'll read verse 24 down to verse 30. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares, that is, weeds, among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn." So this is a, a parable that Jesus uses here. He, he um, again, draws on everyday life. This is an agricultural uh, parable here. And this is one of the rare parables uh, which Jesus interprets. A lot of times he would teach a parable and uh, people would walk away wondering, I wonder what all that means, because the parable w- would use terms that required the listener to really try to unpack that and understand what's kind of the veiled meaning behind some of these things. But this is one of the rare times that Jesus interprets his own parable. So if you'll jump further down into chapter 13, verse 36, we'll see the interpretation here. Verse 36, it says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying... Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. Now, this, this cracks me up because, you know, listen, the disciples were not the sharpest knives in the drawer. I mean, let's just be real. Um, but, but they serve as a good example for all of us because Jesus chose very ordinary people to do his extraordinary work, meaning he can use any of us as well. So they're good examples for us. These guys were not always, uh, you know, the brightest bulb. And so when they're alone in a room... They ask Jesus to interpret it. So this is how I picture it. Sometimes Jesus is teaching the parable uh, to the multitude, and the disciples are standing around nodding their heads. Mm -hmm. That's right. Preach on. Yeah, we get this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they get quietly in a room, and they're like, Jesus, could you explain that parable to us? We really don't get it. So that's what's happening here. In verse 37, he answered and he said to them, and here he interprets the whole thing. He who sows the good seed is the son of man. That's, That's Jesus. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. 
but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so basically when Jesus interprets this parable, what he's telling us is it's a, it's a story that he's using to communicate a spiritual truth, a moral truth. And he talks about how there are two farmers or two planters, two sowers. And he explains to us in the story, he says, one of the sowers is me, is Jesus. And the other sower is the enemy, the devil. And he says, basically, I'm going throughout the world because the field represents the whole world. Jesus is saying, I'm going throughout the world. I'm sowing good seed, which will sprout up to be wheat. He says, but be warned, there's the enemy, the devil, who's also going around throughout the world sowing bad seed. That's the tares or the weeds. And there's the difference between the sons and daughters of the kingdom. That's represented by wheat who belong to Jesus and the sons and daughters, the offspring of Satan, represented in the story by the weeds. And Jesus says at the end of the age, he says, I'm going to dispatch my angels. They're going to separate the wheat from the weeds. The, the, the weeds are going to be bound up and thrown into the fiery furnace. And where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, it's a picture of hell. It's a picture of judgment. And he says, but the wheat, however, the righteous ones who belong to me as part of the kingdom of heaven will enter into their eternal reward. He said there in verse 43, he says, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He says, so he's talking here about the ultimate reward for the righteous who know Christ as Lord and Savior. They're going to enjoy their ultimate reward in heaven, whereas the unrighteous, those who have rejected Christ, will face judgment. It'll be a time of terrible agony for them. So he's expressing the whole concept here of the kingdom of, he of heaven, and he uses this terminology of the wheat and the weeds or the tares. Now, in Israel, and it's common here in the United States, there is a weed that springs up among wheat, and that weed is called Darnell grass. It looks very similar to wheat. In fact, you cannot tell the difference in the early stages of what wheat is and what Darnell grass is until they reach maturity. And when they reach maturity and they form the ear on the top or the top of the stalk, the kernels, then you can tell the difference. That's why in the parable, Jesus says you're going to have to let them both grow at the same time until they reach maturity, until it's time to harvest, because only then can you distinguish the wheat from the tares. And if you try to go about uprooting the weeds before you can distinguish the two, you will inadvertently uproot the wheat, and you don't want to do that. So he says, let them both grow together. Now, here is a picture of Darnell grass and wheat, and they, they look very similar. The Darnell grass on the left, the wheat on the right, and it is only when they form the head or the ears of the grain that you can tell the difference. But you still have to look carefully. But it's the idea they have to reach maturity. The good seed and the bad seed are allowed to grow up together until they reach maturity, and at the time of the harvest, then you can tell the difference. Now, here's the takeaway. The righteous and the unrighteous grow up together in the same world, in the same field. Uh, we all live together. Believers and non-believers will live together, work together, play sports together, do life together. But there's a big difference. There's a big difference between the two that will be realized at harvest time. When we come to full maturity, so the idea is you're going to stand before God at some point, either when you come to full maturity and you die and you have a day of reckoning with God, or in the larger picture, what he's talking about here is the end of the age when God is going to dispatch his angels to separate the righteous from the unrighteous, the wheat from the tares, and the tares, the weeds, the unrighteous will be judged and there will be eternal punishment 
and the righteous will likewise inherit their eternal reward because of their relationship with Jesus. And, and so this is important for us to understand. Just because life presently seems similar now, where the righteous and the unrighteous grow up together in the same world, work together, play together, do life together, it seems sometimes like the unrighteous are getting away with stuff. But the fact of the matter is, don't forget that there is a day of reckoning for every single one of us when the wheat will be separated from the weeds, the righteous will be eternally rewarded, and the unrighteous will be eternally judged. Right now, we are growing up together in the same field, but harvest day is coming. Stay strong and faithful. That's the idea. Parable number two, he compares the kingdom of heaven to a mustard seed. Well, we read the interpretation of the first parable, so you've got to backtrack. Go up to verse 31. Go back to verse 31 and 32. It's only two verses long. Here's the second parable we're looking at. Verse 31, another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Now, some, if not most, theologians regard this parable as a beautiful description of the ultimate expansion of the church and the great growth and the far reach of the kingdom of heaven. However, in light of the parable itself and its context, the parable that it follows and the parable that it precedes, Jesus is not giving a healthy description of the church, but a warning of the possible corruption in the church that we have to be aware of. Now, how do we know that that's the better interpretation of this? Because for two reasons. Number one, a mustard seed grows normally into a large bush, never into a tree. So the first thing that is an anomaly here within this parable is Jesus talks about a mustard seed is planted, and he says here it grows greater than the herbs and becomes, verse 32, a tree, a tree. So what he's describing here is something that has become an abnormal, unnatural monstrosity, something that it wasn't intended to become. And the other important thing that, to note in the story here is that birds are perched in the branches of this tree. Now, in Bible college, there's a thing that they teach you called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics just means how to study the Bible. And one of the tools of how to study the Bible is something called expositional constancy. What does that mean? What it means is when you look at a term or a word or a phrase in the Bible that is consistently meaning one thing, it doesn't suddenly change and mean something different, that there's expositional constancy through a passage, and, and so you, you can um, rely on the meaning of something as not changing because of the consistent nature of how it's being interpreted. And so when it comes here to expositional constancy, birds in the Bible are never reflective of something good. They are always symbolic of something evil. So for people to say that this parable means, you know, beautiful birds perch in the branches of this tree, birds never mean something pleasant. They always mean something evil, and a mustard seed does not grow to become a tree. So Jesus is speaking of some mon unnatural monstrosity that happens, and something evil is perched within the branches here. There are evil, corrupt things that have found shelter in the tree, and he's warning us about it. Now, let me point out this expositional constancy. Go back further in chapter 13, same chapter. Go back earlier in the chapter to verse 3. And I want to just show you what I'm talking about here so you understand the consistency of interpretation. In chapter 13, what we didn't read, verses 3 and 4, says this. And then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside and the birds. Notice. The birds came and devoured them. All right, now, he interprets this also. Go to verse 18, and he tells us what the birds are a picture of. In verse 18, he says, Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. 
When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. So in verse 3, he talks about birds come and snatch the seed, which is the gospel. And then in verse 18, he says, oh, the birds were a picture of the wicked one, the enemy, who comes and snatches the seed before it takes root in somebody's heart. So by the time you get further on into this parable, back now into verses 31 and 32, and he's talking about a mustard seed growing into this monstrosity of a tree and birds perched in it, birds don't suddenly mean something pretty. It still is consistent with the passage. He's speaking of something evil here. You know, in in the Bible, when you hear uh, stories about a dove, now a dove is always a picture of what? Peace. A dove is always consistently throughout Scripture a picture of peace. A dove doesn't suddenly become a picture of death. It's just always consistently a picture of peace. You know, I think it was Alfred Hitchcock who made that movie on the birds. Okay, evil birds. He didn't make a movie on the doves. That wouldn't fly. Oh, that, no pun intended. <laughs> but he, he made a movie about the birds, these evil birds attacking people. And so this is the idea here. When Jesus speaks about birds perched, they're evil. They're corrupt things. They're not of the tree. They don't contribute to the tree. They're simply there to pollute it. There's a warning here about the kingdom of heaven that it will be fraught with corrupt influences and how we need to be wise and discerning about what has perched in the branches. The liberal church today that has abandoned the Word of God, that has embraced and celebrated aberrant lifestyles, that has substituted biblical justice for social justice, is nothing more than an evil influence perched in the branches of an overgrown tree that looks nothing like what it is supposed to. And this is what he's talking about. And so it's a warning as well as a description here. Parable number three, he likens the kingdom of heaven to leaven or yeast. It's one verse. Look in your, in your chapter there, Matthew 13, verse 33. Another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven or yeast, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. In other words, so all been infiltrated by the yeast. Now again, some, if not most people, interpret this parable as a wonderful thing about how the kingdom of heaven invades the earth like leaven or yeast invades dough. But the problem with that interpretation is that like the birds... In the previous parable, leaven or yeast is always a picture of sin in the Bible. So this is not a good thing that he's talking about here. Jesus is saying this is a bad thing about how corruption can seep into the kingdom community just like yeast or leaven starts to seep into work its way into dough. Now, whenever I uh, read about leaven or yeast in the Bible, it it always reminds me of this thing that happened in the Hamrick household uh, some like 30 years ago now. Um, And I've told this story uh, probably a decade ago or so. But um, how many of you are old enough to remember? It was kind of a phenomenon that swept through uh, communities in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, that there was this thing called friendship bread. Can I see your hands? Friendship bread. So some of you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, here's what it was. A friend (laughs) would give you a lump of dough, like the size of a golf ball. And it was a you know, a nice gesture like, here, why don't you start this gift that keeps on giving? And so you take this little dough the size of a golf ball, and then there was instructions. I mean, you had to follow these meticulous instructions in order to make bread. And so you would take the little golf ball, and you would put it in a Tupperware, and you would add yeast at just the right times, and a little bit of water at just the right times. And then sometimes you'd have the lid sealed on the Tupperware. Other times you had to burp it and keep the lid off. You had to follow it very, very carefully. And then as it would grow, you would separate it, put it into another Tupperware, separate it, put it in another Tupperware, and you'd go through all of this careful instructions, add a little yeast, add a little water, burp it, don't burp it, lid, no lid, all this kind of stuff, right? 
Oh my goodness. So it took about two weeks to get all of it just right so that then you could bake bread. So you'd have all this wonderful bread in your house and before you baked the bread, you would take a little pinch off of one of the dough balls the size of a golf ball and you'd hand it to one of your friends. It was the gift that kept on giving. All right, so we had this whole thing going at our house. The whole counter laid out with like six or seven Tupperwares and the instructions there on the kitchen counter. And we were faithful. Add a little yeast. Oh, burp it now. Oh, put the lid on. Oh, it's so cute. All right. Well, my wife was pregnant. Terry was pregnant. And she went into labor. And so off to the hospital we went. Now, this was back in the day when you would go to the hospital to have a baby, and it took about three days. We were there like three days. Now you have a baby like a drive-by shooting. Do you know what I'm saying? You, you drive by the hospital, you shoot the baby out, and on home you go. I don't get it. But anyway, back in the day, it took like three days. So we're three days in the hospital. I wasn't thinking about friendship bread. We're having a baby. Totally forgot about friendship bread. Let me tell you something. Don't ever turn your back on friendship bread. <laughs> I got home after three days. That friendship bread was wicked. It was nasty. It had an attitude. I'm not kidding. Now, listen, I have the gift of exaggeration, but I'm not exaggerating at all when I say to you, it blew the lid off of all the Tupperware containers. That dough was on the ceiling, on the walls, on the floor. Everywhere, all over our kitchen. What do you think I did as a loving husband? Honey, I know you just had a baby, but can you get... No, I didn't. No, I didn't do that. No, I'm cleaning. I'm cleaning it all. I'm cleaning it all. And at the whole time, I'm cleaning. And I got I to gotta confess to you. I mean, I'm a Christian and I'm a pastor at that. But in my heart, I was despising that friend who gave us that dough. Like, this ain't no friendship bread. This is demon dough. I mean, I was... I was beside myself, just what in the world just happened? And then all of our friends didn't like us because the whole experiment exploded, and so we didn't have any golf balls to give to anybody. <laughs> Come to my house, get it off the ceiling if you want. You're my friend, clean my kitchen floor. Have your own friendship bread, scoop it up off the floor. Anyway, nobody has to tell me that when you read about leaven in the Bible, it's a nasty thing nasty thing. And that's what Jesus means here when he's talking about leaven that works its way through the whole batch of dough here. He's not talking about something nice. He's talking about something that, is, that creeps throughout the whole thing. And, and so the idea here is because leaven is always in the Bible a picture of sin, when leaven is allowed to multiply in the church instead of addressed as sin, it corrupts the church. It corrupts the kingdom. G. Campbell Morgan said the church pure is the church powerful. The church loses its power and loses its influence when it becomes impure, corrupted. And that's the point of this parable. Then a transition occurs, and I got to race through the last three here, but a transition occurs at this point. The first three parables were warnings about a mixture of good and evil and the potential of corruption to seep into the church, into the kingdom community if we're not careful. The last three parables, very different. The last three parables are about the value that God places on each of us and how he relentlessly pursues us because he wants us to enjoy the kingdom of heaven and all of its wonderful benefits. So parable number four, he said the kingdom of heaven is like hidden treasure. It's one verse, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Earlier this year, a treasure of nearly 70,000 Iron Age coins was discovered off the coast of France on one of the British Isles called Jersey. And here's the headline and a picture with it. Massive Iron Age coin hoard worth $13 million sets Guinness World Record. Happened earlier in this year. The collection of 69,347 coins was found on the British Isle of Jersey off the coast of France by metal detector enthusiasts Reg Mead and Richard Miles. 
it took them 30 years to find it. And that is a picture, and this parable is a picture of the way that God sees you and me. Underneath that dirt, there's something valuable worth digging up. This is a parable about you and me. Now, some say this is a parable about our pursuit of God and that He is the treasure in the field, but it's quite the opposite. When it tells us, when He, when he teaches us this parable, He said, the man who found the treasure hid it, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. Question, what did you give up to get Jesus? No. What did it cost you to purchase him? No, to the contrary, Jesus gave his life, he gave his all to purchase you and me from sin and death. Revelation 5, 9 says, and with your blood, talking about Jesus, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. God pursued you. God purchased you. You are that treasure in the field, and He shed His blood to get you. That's what this parable is about. And it's important for us to understand the value that He places on us. There's nothing intrinsically good about any of us. Only in so much as he has imputed his righteousness to us through faith in Jesus, but we were the ones worth pursuing. And he loved us so much that he gave his very life to pursue us. The next parable is very similar to this one. The parable, like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's verses 45 and 46. Look again real quick in your Bibles. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, this has the same meaning as the previous parable. You are valuable to God and worth dying for. Romans 3, 10 and 11 says this, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. Listen to that. There is none who seeks after God. Wait a minute. Some of you who are already believers would say, I sought God and I received him as my Lord and Savior. No, you responded to God. He sought you. God is always the initiator. You and I are the responders. He always goes after us. He's the one who pursues us. Nobody seeks him. I never sought after God. I was dead in my transgressions and sins. God sought me and he bought me with his precious blood. That's the basis of the hymn that we sing sometimes, Victory in Jesus. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. You are that pearl of great price and Jesus gave his all to get you. That's his point here. There's one person excited about that. It's true. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Paul says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. The price was the very life of Jesus. The last parable, number six. He compares the kingdom of heaven like a dragnet that was cast into the sea. Verses 47 to 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet, like a fishing net, that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. This last parable is similar to the first one that we studied this morning, in that it talks about a day of reckoning and a day of separation. The first parable we looked at was about separating the wheat from the weeds, the righteous from the unrighteous. This is also along that same vein, but now it's the idea of separating good fish from bad fish, the righteous from the unrighteous. And it's a picture of the end of the age. 
For there will be a separation of the righteous and the wicked, the righteous to eternal life, the wicked to eternal punishment. And the same phrases are repeated in this parable as in the first one we studied. The phrases like the furnace of fire and the wailing and gnashing of teeth for the wicked. Those are statements of punishment and torment and agony. You don't want to go there. No one has to perish. The Bible says God wants none to perish but all to come to repentance. So He created a way for us to enjoy the benefits of the kingdom of heaven if we would be subject to the king. And if we would yield and surrender our lives to him, then we can enjoy enjoy all the many blessings and benefits of belonging to his kingdom. But that becomes a choice that we have to make. And this parable is another reminder to us that one day we have to face God. And the righteous and the wicked will not be separated on the basis of their good deeds. When he talks here about separating good fish from bad, it's, it's, it's not on the basis of our good deeds. It's on the basis of God's good deed when he offered his son Jesus to die on a cross. And thus his goodness is imputed to us by faith in Jesus. It's a relationship with him that makes us then good, if you will, in the eyes of God. Nothing in ourselves, but only the goodness of God imputed to us through Jesus. Now, what I love about this parable is that when the net was dragged... I don't want you to miss this. This is important to see. Look at verse 47 again. Verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea, notice, and gathered some of every kind. I don't want you to miss that. That's important in this parable. Gathered some of every kind. Today in the Sea of Galilee, there are roughly 35 different species of fish. Nobody really knows how many species were in Jesus' day, but the analogy is still the same. He is making the analogy that the net is cast for every kind of fish in the sea. Jesus died for every kind of person. That's again why Revelation 5, 9 says that Jesus was slain and he has redeemed us to God. He has purchased us for God. By his blood, listen, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. These are, these are every kind of fish Jesus died for. Now, obviously, not every person from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation will be saved. There are some good fish and some bad fish from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. The good ones have accepted Jesus. The bad ones have rejected him. But the point is that Jesus died for all that all might be saved. And so the dragnet goes after every single one. No tribe, language, nation, or people is left out. Jesus died for all in the hopes that all might be saved. And please notice, it is never our job to figure out who is saved and who isn't. Because he says here at the end of the age that he dispatches his angels. They separate the wheat from the tares. They separate the good fish from the bad ship. We don't have the dexterity to do that. Neither should we be so judgmental as to presume who is saved and who isn't. That's God's business. We're just to cast the net and let God sort it all out. The bottom line, folks, is this, that the kingdom of heaven is open to all who would believe in Jesus and receive him as Lord and Savior. Do you know him today? Do you know that you are a part of the kingdom of heaven? You know, sometimes I get emails from people who um, try to encourage me to stop leading people in what we commonly call the sinner's prayer because it just, so they say, gives people a false sense of salvation that you can just pray a prayer and then then you're good to go. Um, But I will never stop offering that sinner's prayer and I will tell you why. Because every journey begins with a decision. When you get married... It begins with a decision and the saying of vows. Is that all that marriage requires, just the saying of vows? No, of course not. You have to live it out. But it begins there. When you get saved, when you become part of the kingdom of heaven, it begins with a decision and praying a prayer. Is that all that a relationship with Christ entails, just saying a prayer? No. You have to live it out. But it begins there. It's a starting point. And for those of you who have never made the decision to get out of the starting blocks and run the race, I want to offer you the opportunity right now today to acknowledge Jesus as king instead of you and to become part of the kingdom of heaven. And it begins with a decision.
So if you'd bow your heads with me, let's pray. Father, we come before you humble and thankful for the gift of salvation, how you died on a cross for our sins, the righteous, Jesus, for the unrighteous, us, to bring us to you, God. There are some today who hear this Bible study and they would admit that they're king of their lives and they've never surrendered to you as king. So they're not really part of the kingdom of heaven. But I pray right now and today that they would make a decision to trust you as Lord and Savior and to live their lives following after you, running this race with perseverance. Lord, I pray right now that you would stir the hearts of men and women and young people who need to make a decision today to trust you as Lord and Savior. So I'm going to pause in my prayer with your head still bowed. Those of you even watching online at home, you can pray this prayer with me. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you would admit, yeah, I'm kind of king of my own life, but it's time for me to surrender to Jesus as king, then I want to lead you in a word of prayer. I want to give everybody just an opportunity right where you're seated to pray a simple prayer with me. It begins with a decision. Every journey begins with a decision. Have you decided to make Christ your Lord and Savior? He has been pursuing you. Are you ready to respond to Him? If so, pray this prayer with me. Just right where you're seated, you can whisper this prayer. I'll go slowly. You can just pray this with me. Say, Lord, I thank you that you love me so much that you would offer your son Jesus on the cross for my sins. Forgive me of my sins, Lord. I surrender to you. I'm tired of being king of my own life. I want you to be king, Lord. So I surrender to you as king of my life that I might enter the kingdom of heaven. By faith, I receive you. I believe that you died on a cross for my sins. I surrender my life to you. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen and amen.